All right, everybody, good morning. good morning. It is good to see you. Welcome to Sunnyside. I, uh, it's been a while since I've been up here and preaching. My name is Eric, by the way. <laughs> I'm one of the pastors here. Hey, hi, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I was out for about a month. Uh, only one week of that was, was vacation time where I was out on a hunting trip. And uh, I want you guys to know, for all of you animal lovers that were praying for me not to get anything, Again, it seemed like God answered your prayers this last week. Stop clapping, whoever you are. But uh, we had a good time out there, and, and it just worked out for the sermon series uh, recently and the, uh, the end game series and some different things that were going on that, uh, that I've been out for a while, so I'm glad to be back. I'm going to be sharing uh, next week as well, uh, and I'm excited to do so because this whole hero-making series has been very, very, um, I think, encouraging to us as a church, to me personally as well. And I want to begin this morning by just asking you a simple question. What is it that you enjoy sharing? We all like to share stuff. We all like to have the things that we have and and share it with somebody else. Anybody here ever heard of Amish friendship bread? Some of the older folks, I think, have heard of that. We used to do that all the time. My wife used to make that. If you don't know what Amish friendship bread is, we're not even sure if it came from the Amish, but it's really tasty bread that you make with yeast, and you take the starter dough, and you you put it all together, and you mix it up, and it has to kind of ferment or something or get rotten. I'm not sure what it is, but it grows in this bowl that you leave out, and uh, then you take some of that. It's called starter dough, and you share it with somebody else. It grows, and they share it with somebody else, and it just keeps passing on. You can make bread uh, from this starter dough. And uh, the point is, is that you get to keep some and you get to give some away. I also was thinking about sharing uh, in my past when I was uh, preaching in the Midwest years and years ago before I came out back home to Colorado. And in Missouri and also some churches in in Ohio when I was in school there, um, we would have potlucks. And by the way, I've heard a rumor, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I've heard a rumor that at Sunnyside, Potlucks are coming back, okay? If you don't know what, yeah, look at that, okay. If you don't know what a potluck meal is, where everybody puts it together, one big pot, and you just take what you can get. That's why they call it potluck. And I remember in the Midwest in Missouri, particularly having potluck meals at our church, it, for the pastor, for the preacher, it was kind of interesting because you had to be very careful. And I had to learn this early on, that never, when you went to a potluck meal, never as a preacher do you fill your plate up with all the stuff that you see at first that you really, really like. Because what happens is you get towards the end of the line of the potluck where everybody has brought their food, and there's that potato salad that this one lady brought because she was late. She had to put it at the end that you don't have any room on your plate for it, and you know she's going to come up during the meal sometimes and say, did you try my potato salad? And if you didn't have room to try it, you were in big trouble. So what I did was, in potluck meals, I took a little bit of everything and kind of calculated to make sure I had room on my plate for everything so that I could say I tried something. Because people love to share. People love to share their recipes. They love to share their food. We love to share our experiences, our vacations, the stories that we have. Uh, We used to do it by slideshows. Now we have um, social and so Facebook is a great place to literally share what's going on in your life, knowledge, information. Now, I know that some, and you're in the room, some of you, like to overshare. Any oversharers? Like, oh, I probably shouldn't have shared that, okay? And we know that there are oversharers, but for the most part, we love to share, and that's good. I think that's the way we were designed to be, is to share what we have. The opposite of sharing is selfish. Who wants to be selfish? We were created to share, and that's what this whole sermon series entitled Hero Maker is all about, sharing the things that God has given to you and the way God has grown you and nurtured you and the things that have been in your life. You get to share that with somebody else and watch them grow as well and make a difference in this world. You see, this is specifically in regard to our circle of influence, and I know some of you in the past couple of weeks, if you've been here, are saying, wait right there. I don't have a circle of influence. And I want to tell you, and if you're new today, if this is your first time with us, and you're saying, well, I, I'm not an influential person. I'm not a leader of anything. or That's a bunch of baloney. We are firmly convicted and believe that everybody in this room has a circle of influence. And everybody has people that are, that are watching you. And you have an opportunity to make a difference. And that's what influence is, is helping somebody else make their world better. 
And I also believe that God has strategically put you where you're at, whether it's in your school or in your place of employment or your neighborhood or wherever it is, wherever your circle is, however big it is, it may be small, it may be big. He has put you there because he wants you to influence those people. I don't care where it is. The Bible has some words for this. We, we call it ambassador or we call it a messenger. It's a hero maker. It's your time to make somebody else into a hero so that you influence them so their world is a better place. I like what Billy Graham said. He said, God has given us two hands, one to receive with and the other to give with. That's because he designed us that way. I thought of this because years ago I used to hear this illustration when I was first learning to preach and I think the first time I heard it was in Bible college a long time ago about the difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea over in the Middle East where Israel is now. You see, the Sea of Galilee takes in all these different tributaries. It's a place of life for that region or for that area. It's very green and lush around it. There's fish and, and other things that live in that sea. It gives out water. It goes down the Jordan River, down to the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea doesn't give anything out. And the water just kind of ends up there and soaks into the ground. Doesn't, doesn't, there's no, no real river that flows out of that, and all the minerals build up, particularly the salt and nothing can grow in or around the Sea of Galilee. It's just dead. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. Well, I want to show you a couple of pictures. The first one is uh, in the, when we were there a year and a half ago, and this is a sign along the roadside right before we turned in to, they call it the Mount of Beatitudes. We would call it the Sermon on the Mount. It's a big hillside, lush, full of green uh, grass and, and shrubbery and nice trees and so forth, similar to what it might have been like during the time of Jesus, and it overlooks the Sea of Galilee. And you can kind of see all the way around the coastline of the sea. It's green and it's lush and there's life there. We had a nice fish dinner that uh, the fish were caught from the Sea of Galilee that day. It's beautiful around the Sea of Galilee, much, much more beautiful than, than I imagined before I went there. But in a couple of days, we were at the Dead Sea. I'm going to show you a picture of that. This is a picture of my daughter, Desiree. She went with us, and she is overlooking um, uh, some barren land. And you can see in the top part of the picture there, uh, the blue is the, the Dead Sea. That was taken from the top of Masada, if some of you are familiar with that piece of land and what that means. But you notice there, there is nothing. It is desolate. Uh, there's no life there in the Dead Sea. It doesn't give anything out, so it just dies. That's a picture of what our lives will be like if we decide and make the decision, I'm not giving anything. I am only a taker. I am not a giver. But God calls each one of us to be a giver, to be someone who shares what he has done in our life with other people. The best thing you can share in your life is Jesus. You can share the story of your life and the story of Jesus in your life with other people and thus make them into heroes just simply by sharing your life with them. You are the only one, by the way, you are the only one who can adequately share your story. And I think God calls you to do that. We like to share other people's stories from up front here, but in reality, when you're out there in the day-to-day -day world, Monday through Saturday, you are the best one to share your story. There was a man healed from a demon in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 39. And he was told after it was all said and done, he wanted to go and be with Jesus. Jesus. Jesus said, no, 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 you don't need to come with me. But what you do need to do is go back and tell everybody what God's done in your life. Woman at the well was the same thing. She had this great, fantastic experience with Jesus. She wasn't even sure exactly who he was. He just was, could he be? Is it possible? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? I don't know, but what I do know is, and she told everybody about her experience with Jesus, and it changed lives just by sharing her story. You see, Christianity is all about relationships. First, it's about your relationship to God. Secondly, it's about your relationship to other people. So it's to God first and then to other people. Matter of fact, Jesus said this is the top two commandments. If you want to know what the most important things are as a Christian is you work on your relationship with God and you work on your relationship with other people. And the best way to work on your relationship with other people is to share your story with them. By the way, 
Do selfish people make good friends? How many of us decide, I think I'm going to go find a selfish person to be my best friend because they make good friends? Of course not. We want people in our lives who are, who are willing to share. And people want us in their life, if we're willing to share, it's about fulfilling that great commandment of loving other people. A couple of principles that we have been sharing so far in this series, Joe and Corey both touched on them, is number one, behind every hero is a hero maker. So when you see somebody who's, who's done significant things and is an influencer, behind the scenes somewhere is somebody who has influenced them. Secondly, is there is someone who needs you to put a cape on. And so we know within that circle of influence that you have, there is somebody. They may not know it yet, and you may not know it yet, but there is somebody there who needs you, not me, not somebody else, but you to put a cape on them. And that's the picture that we want you to, to take home through this series. So, so far, the hero makers, Joe started off with John the Baptist, who was pointing to Jesus. That's what he did. That's how he made heroes. Secondly uh, was Barnabas. Corey took that one. And, and by the way, one of the heroes that Barnabas chiefly was responsible for and encouraging was a man by the name of Paul, the apostle. Now, many of you may have heard of Barnabas, but most all of you have heard of Paul. Even people who don't go to church know that when we say the word Paul in this context, they know who we're talking about, one of Jesus' followers. Maybe never heard of Barnabas, but it was Barnabas that first encouraged and got behind Paul. And this is what happened then when Paul, in his own right, you know, saw God's purpose for him and began to work that out, live that out in his life, that's what he lived for, was to make other heroes. And so what Paul does is he takes hero making into a whole nother level. He lived to share his story and to put a cape on anybody who'd listen or anybody who'd pay attention. And one of those people that paid attention to Paul and listened to him and became a hero in their own right was a guy by the name of Timothy. And Paul ended up writing a couple of letters to him. I call them hero-making letters because he was pouring himself into Timothy through these two letters, and they made their way into our Bible. They're called First and Second Timothy, okay? Paul wrote to Timothy. Both of those letters are hero-making letters. So if you brought your Bible this morning, I want you to get it out and turn to Second Timothy. I also have it on the screen, and part of it is in your sermon outline if you're following along on that. But here, in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, Paul is telling Timothy, listen, Timothy, I made you a hero. Now it's your turn. And things are beginning to click with Timothy. I made you a hero. So in your ministry to the church there in Ephesus, to the ministry to the people that come in contact with you, I want you to make them heroes and do it in such a way that they then take what they are learning from you and, and investing it into other people and to other people, and hero-making continues this cycle. We also call it discipleship. Okay? This is the way that the church is supposed to work. So I want to read that text, just a couple of verses in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first two verses. Verse 1 says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I want you to remember that. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, okay? Now the next verse says, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he is obviously referring to the things that he has taught Timothy about Jesus, the things that you've heard from me. I want you to trust, entrust to other faithful men who will be able to teach others also to keep this thing going. It's called the kingdom of God. So, the big idea, the one idea that I want you to remember is very simply this. There is someone who needs what you have. We've been telling you this since Joe started a couple of weeks ago and Corey reiterated, I'm just saying it in a different way, is that there is somebody in your life, in your circle of influence that needs what you have. Can you please hear that? Don't let that just go over your head or just be something nice that Eric said. I mean it. If everyone in this room took this seriously, 
and made a hero out of that one person, the kingdom of God would double. It would grow. I believe that. Okay, so there is someone who needs what you have. Let me give you just three words to remember in regards to this, these first couple of wor- uh, verses in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The first word is found in the first verse, grace. I want you to remember the word grace. And the reason is, is that Paul often talked about the grace that he received in his own life, the mercy that he received. I was talking with a couple of guys in, uh, in between services and said, this is, this is hard for us to receive grace sometimes. It's hard for us to be reminded of grace. We can accept the grace of, yes, my sins are forgiven and and I accept the work of the cross and I know that I'm going to heaven, but the daily grace that comes every single day is hard for us. Why? Because we mess up so much, right? And Paul tells Timothy, his young hero, he says, don't ever forget the grace that God has given you and don't, don't ever forget to be strengthened by that. Satan wants to do the opposite. He wants to take grace out of the, out of the equation. He wants to put works in its place and, and make you feel the only time you're valuable is when you're really worth it. Do you know you are just as valuable to Jesus when you mess up as when you're on, on top of things and doing things perfectly? You're just as valuable. It doesn't matter. Let that strengthen you. Let that encourage you, Paul says. Never forget you're saved by grace. You live under grace, not law. You're what you are by grace. You come to the very throne room of God only by grace. God's grace is completely sufficient for you, the Bible says. It's all you need. Grace is always with you. Grace, then, is what strengthens you. What strengthens you? Your abilities, your prowess, your accomplishments? Paul said that's nothing but dung. Except in the Greek, he used a much stronger word. (laughs) He said, this stuff doesn't mean anything. What means everything is grace. And he wants Timothy, let that be your strength. Why? Because grace then is the most valuable thing that you can share with another person. If you want to make a hero out of somebody, they need to understand the grace that strengthens you that you live by. And you need to be able to share that with them. And that someone, whoever that someone is in your life, needs to see the grace that you have be a part of their life. And say, yeah, dude, I am, I am a total screw up. I get it. It is only by the grace of Jesus that I do what I do. And you can have that too. And hero making starts there by accepting and realizing grace. Grace, another word for grace is gift. Something that you don't deserve. You, you avoid what you do deserve, punishment. You get what you don't deserve to be rewarded. Matter of fact, in one place in 2 Timothy 1, 6, he's, Paul says to fan that gift, that grace, fan it into flame. Just, you know, keep it going. You know, because Satan wants to squelch it and put it out. And what that does is that gives you confidence that God loves you, that he cares about you, and that he has a purpose for you. And there's somebody in your life that needs to see that. They need to see the effect of grace, and they need to say, that is compelling to me. I want some of that. That's where hero-making starts. Does that make sense? To really comprehend grace and live it out every day, not just when you first become a Christian. And that's wonderful. That's when we have the party. That's when we get baptized. But every day, We understand, boy, today is another day of grace. I don't know about you, but I need it every day because I'm a total screw-up every day. Second word I want you to remember is the word discern. And the reason I say that is because Paul said, I want you to take what you've seen in me, what you've heard from me, and I want you to give it to faithful men. Faithful men. That's going to require some discernment. Find those who are reliable. Find those people in your life who are ready, who God puts on your heart. Invest into people who receive what you are sharing. Corey last week urged us to be like Barnabas and be on the lookout for these people. He was on the lookout for Paul. Something about Paul made him think, this guy's got it. There are people like that in your life. You may need to ask prayers for that, ask for wisdom. Talk to other people like, what do you think about? Should I invest in that person? You know, 
how much should I invest in that person? I want to put a little caveat in there. And that caveat is this. Discerning can be a gift for some. I think it's, there are very few people really have the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment means I can look at somebody right away and tell whether or not they got it or they don't have it. Okay, I think that's a very rare gift. I don't have it. I think I have some wisdom sometimes in discerning people, but to be right all the time, no. I don't, think, I don't know that Paul had it either because he had a lot of disappointments in his life. He invested in people that didn't pan out. Did you know that? Paul invested in people that didn't pan out. It's not an exact science. He invested in a guy by the name of Demas in 2 Timothy 4, and uh, this guy deserted him. He left him. He says later in verse 16 of that same chapter that everybody's left me except Luke. That's the Apostle Paul. If people leave the Apostle Paul, how can we not think that people are gonna disappoint us? So just kind of expect that. One of the biggest heartaches in ministry for me has been people that I've invested in fall off the vine. People that I've invested in disappear, even betray or turn their backs on me, on the kingdom of God, on Jesus. That's a huge heartbreak. And the only thing that can keep me going, the only thing that kept Paul going is the grace of God. Because I can look at the grace that has been given to me and think, Jesus, I've turned my back on you so many times. You could have said, see you, chump. I'm tired of this. But he never has. And he hasn't done that to you either. And so I would say, err on the side of believing the best in people. Let the grace of God cover you when they disappoint you. Who should you be investing in? Well, Certainly not everybody is worth all of your time. Maybe sometimes it's just a word of encouragement to somebody. Say, this is what I have for you today is a word of encouragement. With technology, by the way, that's an easy thing to do now through emails and Facebook messaging and texting. I can't tell you the number of positive Facebook messages and texts that I get that just could change my, kind of my trajectory for that day like that. Asking God, how do I utilize what you've given to me and share that with these faithful men and women? Who is it should, that, that I should invest in? And let me just give you a little hint. I think family first. This really hit me a couple of weeks ago when Joe was preaching. I don't know if you caught it, but at the end of his message, he took the cape and he gave it to his son. And I thought, yes, that's it. I spent my life investing in my four children before I did any of my ministry. My wife and I made that decision even before we got married and we knew we were going into the ministry. And I don't regret it at all. All my four kids, they love the Lord. They're serving him in some way or fashion. Not perfect kids, but they love Jesus. And I'm glad that I made them heroes first and foremost. And I've had a lot of hero makers in my life, most of whom I would call seasonal. That's kind of a phrase that I've coined. There are seasonal um, heroes, hero makers that, that come into your life just periodically. Maybe it's just the first time you met them. It's a stranger and they, they speak something into your life because they know you need it. Maybe they have that sense or that gift of discernment. Maybe it's somebody that you know for just a few short weeks that you're with or maybe it's somebody that's just in your life for a couple of years. And I have tons of those people. I can list many, many seasonal hero makers, but my father has been probably the chief hero maker, even though he didn't do it a lot because I don't think he really knew how, was a hero maker to me. He lost his father when he was 16. My grandfather passed away. I never knew him. He found out years later that my grandfather had committed suicide. And he lived with somewhat of an oppressive mother after that. He didn't have any siblings. He really didn't know how to be a dad until he got married and started having kids on his own. But I do remember the times when he was very specific about teaching me or teaching us kids. One time we went to Myrtle Beach uh, in South Carolina. It was the first time I believe we went there. We went there a couple of times uh, from West Virginia to Myrtle Beach. Anybody ever been to Myrtle Beach? Beautiful place. Uh, we went there on vacation and it was our first time. And, and Dad told us, you know, um, one of the things that we're going to do is fly kites because we lived in West Virginia where all the haulers and the, you know, you know what a hauler is? Cricks. You know what a crick is? It's a creek. 
Okay, they're down in hills. We don't have much wind there. that We can room to fly a kite, a lot of vegetation. So we get down to South Carolina, this big beach, lots of wind. We're going to fly kites. And so we bought a kite on the way down there. I guess I've always been an early riser because I went down. Um, they got up before everybody else did, and I went and dug through all the stuff and found the kite. I took it down to the beach by myself. had no idea what I was doing. I put the thing together and flew it up and promptly destroyed the thing <laughs> with the strong wind coming off in the morning time. And I had to take that beat-up old thing back to... The, the camper and show dad when they're having breakfast that I destroyed the kite. And she said, okay, son, let's go for a walk, which usually was not a good thing. Um, <laughs> but that day was really a good thing, and he just kind of put his arm around me and began to talk to me. I don't remember much about anything that he said except for one thing. He said, you know, son, you're very independent, and that's a good thing. Now, that's all I remember. I'm sure there was something else about being responsible and, you know, independent doesn't mean you live in a vacuum and all that. I'm sure there was lots of that kind of stuff. But all I remember is, son, you are very independent and that's a good thing. You know what he did? He made me a hero that day for tearing up a kite <laughs> because he found something good. And those are the kinds of moments that hero makers live for with your kids, with that student in your classroom, with that coworker in the cubicle next to you or in the truck as you're going to work. But you got to be discerning. You got to pay attention to who those faithful people are when that moment is right. The third word that I want to share with you, and the last one, is to entrust. To entrust means to give something away of value. What's the most valuable thing that you've ever held in your hands? I got to thinking about that, and I've never held a gold bar or a silver bar or jewelry worth tens of thousands of dollars, so you can tell my wife's got all cheap jewelry that I've given to her, okay? And I got to thinking, what of value have I held? Well, my children when they were born. Most valuable thing I've ever held in my hands. And when we were young, before we had our first child, we were kind of what I call in our hippie stage, and we were trying to be, we were trying to be organic and natural before it was cool. And we wanted to do this natural birth. My, my wife said, I'm not going to the hospital. I want to do the natural birth. And, uh, well, we, just, we were too chicken to do the at-home birth thing. And we said, well, let's do a midwife. So we did a midwife and didn't go to the hospital. And we had a midwife do the whole process. And he said towards the end of the pregnancy, you want to do the delivery, Eric? I said, sure. That is so cool. And uh, so I'm in the delivery room. And I'm waiting. I got the catcher's mitt and everything. And we're waiting for Daisha. That's our oldest daughter. Um, she's 35 now. Waiting for her to come out. Didn't come out. Didn't come out. Didn't come out. I said, hey, what's going on here? She says, I don't know. Let's go get the doctor. So the doctor comes in. And she was uh, all cockeyed or something. I don't know. He fixed it up. And so he said, okay, you can go back in. So I'm, I'm back there and I'm ready. And you know something? When those babies decide to come, they come fast. <laughs> okay. And you got latex gloves on and they are slimy <laughs> and slippery and so Daisha's there all of a sudden, and I'm holding her and squiggling around, and I drop her on the floor. No, I didn't drop her on the floor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I do remember holding her and thinking, this is the most valuable thing I've ever held. Matter of fact, her name, Daisha, is a word that means gift from God because we were so enamored by the whole birth process and life. You know, when God has given you what he's given you, he says, I want you to take that thing of great value, the grace, the things that you've, you've grown to, to know about me, and I want you to, like there's, there's just something so valuable, and I want you to hand it to somebody else. I took Daisha and I, I handed her to the midwife, and, and I was very careful, I didn't drop her. It's very careful when they got her cleaned up and weighed her and did all those things. You see, entrusting is not dumping your responsibilities, not just saying, here, you take them. You step into the role of hero yourself when that time is right, but your mindset of a hero maker is that I am giving you something of great value. Some people don't want to do that, by the way. They don't want to hand off that which value because they are selfish and, and they want to have all the glory and they want to continue to be the hero. But we, as Christians, need to help others become the hero. Your gift doesn't end with you. And if you're selfish with it, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, God's going to be selfish with you. If you're generous, he'll be generous with you. Why? Because there is someone in your circle of influence who needs what you have. Now, there's plenty of places where 
Paul practices this and lives it out. One of the places is the church at Philippi. And with the remaining time that I have left, I just want to share with you a couple of things that I think Paul did for the folks at Philippi. Philippi, by the way, the letter of Philippians is where we, we get this, is, is a place that didn't necessarily hold all of fond memories for Paul. Paul got beaten up there pretty bad. He got thrown out of town in Philippi. But a church was started and established there, and it was growing. And he wanted to make heroes out of all those people in that church. He didn't care about his past. He didn't care about what happened to him. He said, matter of fact, it might happen to you, so I want to make you hero makers. How do you handle that? It's in Philippians chapter 1. Again, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn there. I'll have this up on the screen. But I want to give you a model for hero making because we've been telling you now for three weeks, go be a hero maker. We've, we've set the foundation. We give you the precedence. Let's put some, let's put some meat on this and, and, and make this into reality. How do I do this? I'm just going to give you four simple things to do to make somebody into a hero. Number one, if you go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul is talking to, to, these, to these church folks and he's encouraging them to be hero makers, and he's praying for them. He says in verse three, I thank God, my God in all my remembrance of you. So important that we have gratitude for the people that God has put into our life in that circle. Do you pray for those people? Do you thank God, whether they're not heads, whether they're good people, whether they're bad people, whether they're people that frustrate you, they're in your life. Thank God for them. Show gratitude for the people in your life. Someone needs to know that you are grateful for them in your life. You know? Isn't it good when somebody comes up to you and says, I am just so glad I got to know you. I'm glad you're in my life. Guys, that's hard for men to say to each other. But when we do say it, I can guarantee you that we love it. It's a little easier for, for the gals sometimes, it seems. But we all need to do that. Show gratitude. Secondly, in verses four and five, then he says, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And he tells those folks who struggle with him, who've seen his, his ups and downs, he says, I am just so joyfully talking to God about you all the time, you don't even know. Joyfully talk to God about those people and talk to God on behalf of them, and then let them know. Send a note, send a text, prayed for you today, with joy. So glad. Verse six goes on and says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. We've talked about this I see in you principle, I see in you potential, I see in you a gift, I see in you the ability. We ought to use that phrase over and over again, and what we're saying by that is I expect the best in you because God is working in your life. And, and, and you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what Paul tells the Philippians. You ain't seen nothing yet. Do you know there's somebody in your life that needs you to say that to them? And they are just waiting. Jump down to verse 8. It says in verse 8, um, for, for God is my witness how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Finally, making a hero means treating them like Jesus would treat them. With affection. Some of your versions may say compassion. Compassion. That's how Jesus treats people. We have this mindset of, of we categorize people and we, we put them into different categories. Just treat them like Jesus would treat them. And Jesus wants everybody to be a hero. You know, I lost my dog last year. I had a golden retriever. Winston had him 12 years. He was my, he was my bud, my hiking partner. And I miss old Winston. And I uh, haven't gotten a dog since. But the young lady that lives with Don and, and me... Um, Got a dog not too long ago. Well, we think it's a dog. It's not, I'm not sure. You know, I, I love big dogs. I'm a big dog, dog guy. And this thing is only about that big. It's a miniature terrier. Or something. I don't know what it is. Um, it's a cat that thinks it's a dog. That's what it is. Um, but it's about this big. Uh, all of that, you know. And uh, it knows I don't really necessarily have fond affection for him like Jesus would uh, because I'm not sure Jesus does. But anyway... Um, loves Aaliyah, loves Aaliyah, and runs to her, and they play and everything. And so I will go get the little thing, and I'll tease it, 
Okay, I, I do tease it, and I'll say, you want to go to Leah? You want to go to Leah? And I'll hold it, and it's going like this, it's going like this, it's going like this, you know, and I'll, I'll just like drop it, and it's like, it just like, doesn't even hit the floor, and it's boom, straight to Leah. and I'll run over, and I'll get it, and I'll come back, and I'll say, you want to go to Leah? You want to go to Leah? And I'll drop it, and bing, it runs to, to Leah and jumps up on her lap, and it just looks at me when I come get it, because he knows what's coming now, okay? <laughs> so we have this little game that we play, but you know, I was thinking about that silly dog, and I'm not mean to it, just so you know. That's the way people are in our lives. That if we do what Paul did to the church at Philippi, it's like just a wind-up toy or a dog that's running. And all they need is a hero maker like you. That's all I need. Who can you put a cape on is the question we've been asking. Do you, do you know someone, and maybe it's not a, a huge thing, but maybe you can be in their life because they need to conquer an addiction. And, and that's preventing them from being a hero. And you know how to help them through that. At least encourage them. Maybe they need to restore their marriage before they go on to where they need to be as heroes. Maybe they just need to receive encouragement. Maybe they, they, they need to have you just check in on them because nobody checks in on them. Maybe they need help financially. And you have the wherewithal to do that a little bit. Maybe they need an official mentor or coach to meet with them weekly. But whatever the case, there is someone who needs what you have. The grace, the love, the knowledge, and the mercy of Jesus Christ. As we wrap this up this morning, I want you to name that person. It's your name. That's your application. That's your live it point. Who is it? And ask God, bring that person to mind. At least a place for you to start. Maybe it is just a word of encouragement this afternoon. Maybe it's a longer investment, a deeper investment of coaching, of mentoring. There is someone that needs what you have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of us here that you would bring those people to mind, those people that need what we have, not because we're anything special, but because you've gifted us, you've given us grace. Help us find those people, help us invest back in them so that they can invest in others and your kingdom continues to grow. We love you, Father God. We thank you that you have invested in us, that you did not give up on us. Like Barnabas, who saw something in Paul when everybody else wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. But he was the world changer and you needed a Barnabas to defend him and to encourage him. Let us be the Barnabases. Let us be the John the Baptist. Let us be the Pauls. It's our turn now. Help us to make heroes out of others, to think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. In Christ's name, amen.